Looking for magic cards? At flipsidegaming.com you can now use the promo code LVD to get a 10% discount on orders over $10 while supporting the channel at the same time. Hello and welcome to another modern gameplay video with the banning of looting and hogank and the unbanning of Stoneforge Mystic. We want to try out some of the new toys we have available in modern right away here with a black-white Stoneforge Mystic mid-range deck also known as Dead Guy Ale in the legacy format. And of course Stoneforge Mystic, for those that don't know, 2 mana for a 1-2 creature. When Mystic enters the battlefield, we can search our library for an equipment card, reveal it and put it into our hand. And then for 1 and a white and tapping Stoneforge Mystic, we can put an equipment card from our hand onto the battlefield right away. So alongside our 4 copies of Stoneforge Mystic, we've got a bit of an equipment package that we can search up. Of course the most powerful option being Batterskull, a 5 mana artifact with a living weapon, so enters the battlefield attached to a 0-0 blank germ token, and the equipped creature gets plus four plus four and has vigilance and lifelink and for three mana we also get to return batter skull from the battlefield back to our hand to maybe save the batter skull from removal and cheat it back into play with the stoneforge mystic or simply to reset the germ token if we don't have another creature to equip and then we also have two swords one copy of sword of fire and ice giving the equipped creature plus two plus two and protection from red and from blue and whenever the equipped creature deals damage to a player we get to deal two damage to any target as well as draw a card so the abilities on sword of fire and ice probably the most powerful among any of the swords and then we also have one copy of Sword of Light and Shadow, which isn't great in any deck, but in this deck where we have a ton of creatures, it's pretty good, giving plus two plus two and protection from white and from black. The protection here being a bit more relevant than Sword of Fire and Ice, depending on the matchup, since both Fatal Push and Path Exile wouldn't be able to kill the creature that's equipped. And then whenever the creature deals combat damage to an opponent, we gain three life, and the life gain is quite nice in this deck, since we're playing four copies of Dark Confident, and we also get to return up to one target creature card from our graveyard back to our hand, and we are playing quite a few creatures we can return, making the Sword of Light and Shadow a pretty appealing option in this particular deck. So this is our Stoneforge Mystic package. Other deck lists often just play a single Batter Skull and Sword of Fire and Ice, sometimes maybe a Sword of Feast and Famine in the sideboard, which is not a very good one, but uh, this is what we're playing. And then looking at the rest of the deck, you'll see a lot of the typical powerful modern cards that you expect to see in a black-white mid-range deck at one mana. We've got a bit of hand disruption with two copies of Thoughtseize and four copies of Inquisition of Kozilek, which is a bit less painful against the aggressive decks. Then we've got some spot removal, two copies of Path Exile, which can exile an opposing creature at the cost of giving them a basic land, and then four copies of Fatal Push, and our mana base is also pretty good at enabling Revolt. Then at two mana, of course, we've got our playset of Stoneforge Mystic, alongside four copies of Dark Confident, two mana for a 2-1 creature, and at the beginning of our upkeep, we reveal the top card of our library, put that card into our hand, and we lose life equal to that card's convert mana cost. The convert mana costs in our deck are relatively low. We do have four copies of Lingering Souls, and of course, some of the equipment, like Batter Skull, can uh, lose a lot of life to Dark Confident, but overall, we're uh, drawing a ton of extra cards, and we can make up for the lost life thanks to some of the life gain we have built into our deck as well. The one toughness can be a liability against a card like Renan 6, which is popular in the Jun decks, but uh, if we can dodge that, then the Dark Confident can both apply a bit of pressure against the combo decks as well as help us draw a ton of cards. And then we also have the full play set of Tide Hollow Scholar to complement the six one mana hand disruption spells as a 2 2 creature when it enters the battlefield. Target opponent has revealed their hand, and we can choose a non land card from it and exile it. But when the Scholar leaves the battlefield, we have to return the exiled card to its owner's hand. Now, one important thing to point out is that if we play Tide Hollow Scholar and the opponent tries to kill it in response to the trigger, then what happens is the Leaves the Battlefield trigger resolves first, meaning we don't have to return anything since nothing got exiled yet and then the Enters the Battlefield trigger will resolve, meaning that we get to exile a card from our opponent's hand regardless of the opponent killing the Scholar, and of course since the Scholar's already gone, our opponent will never get that card back. So the opponent will usually have to let the trigger resolve, which means if they only have one removal spell, we get to take it with the Scholar, and uh, then not fear losing it to a removal spell, unless the opponent top decks another one. Of course if they have multiple removal spells in hand, we can't really play around it, but we can still maybe slow the opponent down, and it's still just a one for one trade in most cases. And then our final 2-drop is a single copy of Collective Brutality, which is a very flexible card. It can be used as a hand disruption spell, taking an instant or sorcery from the opponent's hand, so great against combo and control decks. We can use it as removal, giving a creature minus 2, minus 2, or we can use it to gain a bit of life against the burn decks. And if we want, we can escalate it by discarding a card to get access to multiple modes at once, which is great if we're up against the burn deck, for example. We often want all three modes, and we don't really care about the card disadvantage as much, since there's often cards that we don't want in a matchup, like maybe a Dark Conflict, 
confident. We often want to discard a Lingering Souls, which is our next card here, which has flashback for one and a black, so putting it in the graveyard with Collective Brutality is not a bad way to do it. And of course Lingering Souls, another very powerful card, 3 mana sorcery making 2 one, one Spirit Tokens, and for one and a black we can flash it back from the graveyard to make those two Spirit Tokens once again, synergizes nicely with Stoneforge Mystic, since we get multiple 1-1 one, one Spirit Tokens to put those artifacts onto, and we'll never run out of uh, creatures to equip essentially, and plays well with the Collective Brutality and Liliana of the Veil, as discarding a Lingering Souls is still good value. Liliana, our next card here, 3 mana Planeswalker, can be used as removal with the minus 2 making the opponent sacrifice a creature, and I guess in a pinch we can also sacrifice our Endor Confident if we're afraid of dying to it. With the plus 1 we can make each player discard a card, so plays well with the Lingering Souls. If we have access Stoneforge Mystics that we don't need, we can easily discard those, and just helps us pressure opposing combo and control decks. And then we can pretty easily get to the ultimate minus 6 ability, which can also be pretty backbreaking against a lot of decks. And finally we have our equipment package with a Sword of Fire and Ice, a Sword of Light and Shadow, and a Batter Skull. And then looking at our mana base, we've got some more disruption in the form of Field of Ruin, which can destroy an opposing non-basic client, and let both players search up a basic instead, so helps a lot against the Tron decks, helping us disassemble Tron. And we've got lots of basic lands to go with Field of Ruin, and our four fetch lands, three planes, three swamps alongside our four copies of Marsh Flats, which can search up either the basic lands or the two copies of Godless Shrine, which can make both colors. We also have a single copy of Urborg, which turns all our lands into swamps, so we maybe don't need to sacrifice a fetch land if we're up against a burn deck, or maybe just fix our mana if we draw too many planes. Then we also have the full playset of Concealed Courtyard, which is a nice fast land coming into play untapped if it's one of our first three lands. And finally, two copies of Shambling Vent, a creature land that can turn into a 2-3 creature with lifelink. So nice alongside our Confident if we need to offset the life loss a little bit. And then last but not least, two copies of Silent Clearing, which we can sacrifice to draw a card if we're flooding out, a nice new addition from Modern Horizons. Another land worth considering in this deck, which plays nicely alongside Lingering Souls, is Vault of the Archangel, which we can activate to give our creatures lifelink and death touch until end of turn. So it's great against the fair creature decks where we can trade off with death touch or against the burn decks where we can maybe use the additional life gain. But for now I think Field of Ruin is a bit more important in the colorless land slot, as I expect the Tron decks to rise in popularity now that the fair strategies are more popular as well. So for now I'll uh, play the Field of Ruin, but definitely Vault a nice one to keep in mind. Then moving on to the sideboard, we've got a ton of different one-offs to help us cover our bases against the multitude of modern strategies. And of course with the banning of Looting and Hogak, the graveyard decks did get nerfed, but they will still be a thing, which is why we have a bunch of different graveyard hate cards, one of them being Nile Spellbomb, which we can sacrifice to get rid of the opponent's graveyard, as well as maybe draw a card if we have black mana available. So we can also consider bringing this in against decks that don't necessarily rely solely on the graveyard, but uh, can definitely take advantage of the graveyard, then at least Nile Spellbomb still draws us a card, whereas a card like Surgical Extraction puts us down a card, but also does double duty against combo decks, where we can maybe destroy one of the opponent's lands, like a Valakut or one of the Tron lands, with either a Field of Ruin or a Fulminator Mage, which we'll get to in a second, and then uh, exile it with Surgical Extraction and not give them any additional copies in their deck. And of course, other combo decks, we have a bunch of discard that we can combine with Surgical Extraction to maybe take out a key combo piece. We've got a Celestial Purge to exile a red or black permanent, especially a card like Ren and Six is problematic for a deck, so having a clean answer in Celestial Purge is nice, and can also do double duty against burn decks, taking out one of their creatures, for example. Then we've got a one-off copy of Disenchant, since of course with Stoneforge Mystic being around, we want to have some clean answers for artifacts, and Disenchant is our uh, weapon of choice there. And while a card like Sundering Growth can have a little bit of upside with the Populate since we're playing Lingering Souls, I think uh, the one white mana on Disenchant still gets the nod, especially if we're up against something like Blood Moon, and we can't rely on having a double white up. Then we also have another copy of Collective Brutality to help us out against mostly the burn decks, and can also still be a flexible option if we have a card in the main deck that's worse. We've got two copies of Stony Silence, a bit of a nombo with our swords, but we can always take those out when bringing in Stony Silence and just rely on Batter Skull to go with our Stoneforge Mystics, which doesn't necessarily need to be equipped. Stony Silence is still a great tool against decks like Tron and the various artifact-based decks. 
Then we've got a one-off copy of Kaya's Guile, another nice new flexible card from Modern Horizons, which can double up as removal, a way to gain life against the burn decks. Graveyard Hate, even though it's a little bit slow, now that uh, the Dredge decks, for example, lost Faithless Looting, hopefully they're going to be a one turn slower and Kaya's Guile can still potentially come up as relevant graveyard interaction. Then we also have a one-off copy of Ashok, which also doubles up as Graveyard Hate and can also prevent the opponent from searching their library with uh, spells or abilities. So that's great if we're facing something like a Valakut deck that searches their deck for a bunch of lands, and otherwise we have difficulty interacting in that matchup, so Ashok can be useful there as well. We've got our three copies of Fulminator Mage, which I've already alluded to, which is great against decks like Tron and uh, Valakut, and can also be used in control matchups, for example, where some of our main deck removal spells maybe aren't as effective. Although now with Stoneforge Mystic in the control decks as well, we're still going to want to keep some of our spot removal in the main deck, so maybe we don't need as many Fulminator Mages out of the sideboard anymore. And then we also have two copies of Plague Engineer, which shines against opposing tribal decks and token strategies, also very good against our Lingering Souls, for example. And finally, we have one copy of Gideon LF Zenikar, which can spawn two two tokens, can turn into a 5-5 five, five creature and attack, and can also make an emblem giving our creatures plus one plus one, which is great alongside the Lingering Souls. So this can come in against opposing combo decks to give us a fast clock, can be difficult to remove for opposing control decks. And it's also a fine addition in the grindy midrange mirrors, so definitely a very powerful card, usually gets a little bit better after sideboard, which is why it's not in the main deck, as games tend to slow down a bit and we have more interaction that's relevant for the matchup, and then we have more time to deploy our 4 mana planeswalker. So yeah, that's our deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play, and this hand seems fine. Don't have a 1 mana interactive spell, but we just get to play a shambling vent into a turn to... Probably Scholar before Dark Confident, depends what uh, matchup we're playing. If we're up against a Tron deck, for example, we might be able to play Confident first. If we're up against uh, a more interactive deck, where we expect our first creature to die, then we might want to lead with a Scholar. It's going to be a turn 1 Scalding Tarn into Watery Grave and Serum Visions. So unclear what we're up against here. Inquisition to pick up. So I think I'm going to play the Scholar, and then next turn I can go Inquisition plus Dark Confidence. And I'll just fetch a Swamp. See what we're up against. Alright, looks like a Death Shadow deck. As we see the Namesake card, Dismember, Fatal Push, Angler, Lightning Bolt, Thoughtseize. So they have three removal spells and a Hand Disruption spell, so this Dark Confidence is not going to live. Uh, we do have a nice answer for their creatures with Liliana of the Veil, vale, and Liliana is also a nice way for us to strip apart their hand of relevant interaction before deploying our creatures. So I might just want to take the Thoughtseize, although I guess our opponent can just go Bolt plus Thoughtseize next turn anyway. So I guess it doesn't matter a whole lot what we take. So I guess I'll just take Thoughtseize anyway, in case they go for a different line. If I didn't want my opponent to lower their life total for Death Shadow, I could have taken the Dismember, so they can Dismember the Scholar, for example. Opponent with another Serum Visions, so they won't be able to kill Scholar and Thought Seizes at least, which means we get to resolve Liliana, which is a pretty big deal. So they've got a Thought Seize in hand, and Fail Push is gone. Another Scholar doesn't do a whole lot against all the spot removal they still have. So yeah, let's deploy this Liliana before they can take it away with the Thought Seize. Suppose I could also go Inquisition plus Scholar, and then Inquisition takes a Thought Seize, so Liliana still sticks around. Because I guess they can Lightning Bolt Liliana, so we can't Edict. If they draw into another Hand Disruption spell, it's better to have Liliana in play already. So it's kind of a close decision. I guess I'll go Inquisition Scholar here. And then take Thought Seize and one of the removal spells. And a land is what they picked up in the meantime. So I want the Thought Seize gone forever. And I'll play the Scholar. And what do we take? Don't know if it matters too much. They've got two red sources for the bolts. Maybe the Dismember if I don't want them losing life. But I might actually want them to lose life since we've got the Lingering Souls to pressure them. The problem here is that they could deploy both the Death Shadow and the Gurmag Angler in the same turn. And then Liliana can take the Scarier Threat, which is a Death Shadow. So I guess I'll just take the Lightning Bolt here, which at least forces them to cast a Dismember to get rid of the Scholar if they want to get their Bolt back. Alternatively, I could have taken one of the creatures, so I force them to kill Scholar if they want to play both in the same turn. 
So your opponent plays Blood Crypts, plays Gormag Angler, and plays Death Shadow, leaving them with a Dismember in hand. Another Dark Confident to draw. Soldiers play Liliana, make them sack a creature, and then hopefully we can top deck another Liliana, Fatal Push, Path to Exile. And Lingering Souls can buy us some time. Sags Gormag Angler, keeping Death Shadow. So if I attack, I also grow the Death Shadow, which is not necessarily a good thing, unless we try and cheese them out with the Lingering Souls. But the fact that we also have Dark Confidence, taxing our life total, I don't think I want to attack here. Like, they can dismember at any time if they want to, but I don't think I actively want to lower their life total until we find an answer for the Death Shadow. They do fire off the dismember. Alright, so Death Shadow up to a 5-5. They've got a Bolt in hand and two unknowns. One is Polluted Delta. So if we top deck an answer for Death Shadow, we could be okay. All their opponent taking damage from this uh, Fetchland and Shockland is not a good sign, so they attack us for 8. If they had a team or Battle Rage plus a Lightning Bolt, we would have died. But it just puts us to 9, but we are still dead to an attack plus a Lightning Bolt. So I'm gonna have to cast the Lingering Souls here. I'll plus Liliana first. Don't think we have time to deploy both Dark Confidence, so one of them can go. And then I'll go Courtyard plus Lingering Souls. Still not good enough if they have Teamer Battle Rage. If they have a Stubborn Denial, we're also dead. Opponent discards Fatal Push and hangs on to the Lightning Bolts. Alright, so we're technically still alive. If they top deck Battle Rage, we're dead. And now we've got a Liliana that could minus, forcing them to cast a Lightning Bolt proactively. So Liliana's gone, they've got one unknown in hand. We can chum block Death Shadow for a while. Don't want to take it since otherwise we're also dead to a Street Wraith, cycling, and growing Death Shadow. But Lingering Souls is definitely a good tool to have. So let me flash this back before doing anything. And they did pick up Stubborn Denial, that's too bad. Counters that one. So I think I'll just play the Dark Confident, chum block with the Spirit Token, and then hope that the uh, extra cards from Dark Confident get us there. Opponent casts Opts. Attacks. We'll chump. Also can't forget about the Shambling Vents. Alright, we get to trigger Dark Confidence. Dark Confident reveals Urborg, and Thought sees a draw. Not too useful. So... Do I cast the Thoughtseize? They could have another Stubborn Denial, in which case I just take two. But that frees up future top decks. Also in case they draw a discard spell, they could take away the Thoughtseize if they're also sandbagging another Stubborn Denial, so I think I should cast it here. And they did indeed have another Stubborn Denial, alright. And so what do I do with this Dark Confidence? So Death Shadow is going to be lethal no matter what here. So if they find a single spot removal spell for a single blocker, I would be dead. I could leave both back, or I could put them to three, so that if I top deck, let's say, collect a Brutality, I could drain them out. I think I do attack them, put some pressure on them, and I want to keep the Dark Confident alive, and then Shum block with the Shambling Vent. Ooh, another Death Shadow. Well, now we need to top deck something good. Two lands. Well, that doesn't do it. All right. Well, we had a window to draw out of it, but uh, we drew a couple lands. Potent drew the second Death Shadow. Not according to plan, but we got pretty close. Kind of goes to show how powerful Lingering Souls is. The Stubborn Denial definitely came at the right time. All right. On to sideboarding against the Grixis Death Shadow. So Kaya's Guile, pretty decent at both clearing the graveyard and making them sacrifice a creature. Spellbomb is fine. Uh, Plank Engineer being a Death Touch creature is actually also just decent by itself. Uh, Gideon making a bunch of blockers is fine. And of course Celestial Purge, a nice removal spell. Don't think we need the Fulminator Mages. Ashok also seems a little bit too narrow. Um, don't think we need Brutality or Surgical. So a Plague Engineer is the only other consideration here, just as a Death Touch body. 
It's not super reliable, dies to a lightning bolt, uh, fatal push with revolt can deal with it pretty easily. What don't we like in the main deck? Could maybe trim Sword of Fire and Ice if we need to cut something. Uh, brutality, while fine, is not exciting. Still like the Dark Confidence. So there's not much to dislike in the main deck, to be honest. So I think I'm just going to trim Sword of Fire and Ice, collect a Brutality. And I could see trimming some Scholars, since they have so much removal that it's not a reliable way of taking something from their hand. So I think I trim two Scholars and make room for our four sideboard cards. And then I don't think I'm bringing in Plague Engineer. It's either that over Scholar or not, but I feel like our curve is going to be a bit too clunky if I bring in the Engineers. It is nice that it's kind of an answer for one of their creatures that doesn't get countered by Stubborn Denial, but on the flip side, if they have a team or Battle Rage, they can kind of ignore it and uh, trample over it. I think we're fine. We'll be on the play. And what about this hand? Well, the one land could hurt it, but as soon as we find a second land, we get to deploy Stoneforge. We've got hand disruption and two removal spells, so don't hate it. I'll try. And then we can lead with Thoughtseize, maybe take away an opposing answer for Stoneforge, although they likely have more than one. Three lands, Street Wraith, Angler, Thought Scour. Well, I guess there's two decisions here, either the Thought Scour, which slows down the Gurmag Angler, or just take the Angler itself, but when we have Path and Kaya's Guile as answers, don't know if that's necessary. So I think I'll take the Thought Scour, since they currently don't have a great turn one play besides the Scour. And Scour can fuel both Delve as well as maybe future Snapcaster Mages. So there's some upside to taking it. And it mills more than uh, Street Wraith does. So I think that makes sense. Opponent cycle Street Wraith. There's always a bit of danger to leaving the creature in hand, because if they just find a bunch of discard for your removal, they could still be left with the creature. But uh, in this case, I think we're fine. All right, there's a land, so we get to play Stoneforge. Hope it doesn't uh, get killed right away. At least this one can get Stubborn Denialed. And I think we'll just get the Sword here, since Sword is going to be difficult for them to get rid of. They usually have four Fatal Pushes and maybe one or two Bolts, so that's why uh, the protection from black is much more relevant than the protection from red in this matchup. And of course also their creatures are all black, so we can block those or attack past them. I guess Batterskull might even have more upside if it sticks. If they kill the Stoneforge, then I would rather have the Sword in my hand, since it plays well with the Lingering Souls and the Kaya's Guile, and then it can also get back the Stoneforge from the graveyard. I'm gonna go with the Sword here. And we'll see how that plays out. Opponent gets a tapped Steam Vents, so they probably don't have a Death Shadow in hand if they're not uh, shocking aggressively. Opponent says go. Pick up a land, that's good. So I'm pretty happy just putting the Sword in play end of turn with the Stoneforge. Alternatively, I could cast Lingering Souls, although that runs into Stubborn Denial. And just getting this Sword in play would be pretty useful. And lets me keep up my removal as well. And by putting it in play with Stoneforge instead of casting it, I don't run into a counterspell. Opponent could easily have some number of Colagans commands in their deck as well. We did fix their mana with Urborg a little bit, but we can maybe take them off a rent with a Field of Ruin since they usually don't have a basic mountain. It's gonna be Snapcaster Mage for Thought Scour. That's fine. And mills over Serum Visions and a land. Well, I do get to connect with the Sword of Light and Shadow if I want to here, although there's no creature to get back at the moment. So the question is, do I Fatal Push the Snapcaster Mage or do I not care? I mean, if I Fatal Push the Snapcaster, Kaya's Guile becomes an effective removal spell, whereas otherwise it doesn't. So I feel like I'm okay doing that. And a Marsh Flats to pick up. So I get to cast Lingering Souls and keep a path. And I guess I'm okay attacking for one. They could have drawn a Death Shadow in the meantime, in which case attacking could be a drawback here. But we'll find out soon enough. Takes two from Blood Crypts. And it's going to be Liliana at last hope, pretty effective against the Spirit Tokens as well. So one's gone. And there's Gurmag Angler. I think I'm okay pathing that. I could like untap and cast a Kaya's Guile, which is a bit clunkier than Path, but I want to be mana efficient. Alright, so we don't know what our opponent has in hand. 
We do get to take out this Liliana though. And I suppose I can also cast the Field of Ruin, which still leaves me two mana to equip the sword. So let's do that and take out the Steam Vent since they have infinite black mana thanks to Urborg. And this takes out both a blue and a red. And grab a Plains. And all right, opponent scoops it up. Works for me. On to sideboarding. Do we make any changes? I think I'm still okay with our setup. The only question is, do I want this additional Sword of Fire and Ice? It's still okay in the matchup, but protection from black is just so much more relevant than protection from red and from blue, even though the ability is nicer if we don't have anything in the graveyard. But I think I still like this configuration. Field of Rune is pretty effective against the Death Shadow deck since they don't have a ton of basics, and they usually don't have a ton of lands in play. And the fact that we had two Field of Ruins there messing with their mana, plus taking out uh, Liliana would have been pretty good. Definitely should have attacked first with the equipped sword, since I guess we still had enough mana to first equip and then Field of Ruin. I didn't need to Field of Ruin first to save one mana, in case they somehow had another basic land into like Fatal Push in response to me equipping. Alright, this hand is potentially very good with double Lingering Souls, Liliana for Disruption. Don't have double black, but the Field of Ruin could fix for the second black source. Let's lead with our Inquisition. There is an argument for waiting a turn to play around Stubborn Denial, but there's also the risk of uh, our Inquisition getting taken by an opposing discard spell they top deck. Although, if they don't lead with a discard spell, they're likely to have Stubborn. So yeah, I could have waited a turn there. Since next turn I didn't have anything planned, if I draw a 2-drop, then I'm going to be happy to have uh, cast it anyway. And also getting it out of their hand when we have a 3-mana Liliana and all these Lingering Souls we want to get through, their uh, four spike is still not a bad exchange. Alright, Fatal Push. Let's just play the planes. Opponent on one land, so this Field of Rune could also mess with their mana a little bit. We'll see whether we want a Lingering Souls first or not. And Inquisition to draw. So I guess I like Field of Rune into Inquisition here. We'll deal with the Watery Grave since they have more blue spells we care about. Although they do have a basic island, whereas they might not have basic mountain. Get a swamp. And Inquisition. Could get Stubborn Denial again, but as I've said, we don't really mind when we have a Liliana in hand. Since it might be the card we take anyway. Of course we don't get any information about her hand, which definitely matters. This looks like a Gurmag Angler, which we can answer with Liliana nicely. And no Stubborn Denials to worry about. And I even get to play the courtyards. Opponent at 17, still pretty far away from casting any Death Shadows. And Grix's Death Shadow usually doesn't run Force of Negation, so that's not really on my mind. Thought sees, sees a hand of double Lingering Souls Fatal Push. Takes Fatal Push. Thought sees a draw, pretty good too. Do I want to maybe plus Liliana first? I think so. And what do I discard? Probably one Lingering Souls. And I guess I'll flash it back to play around uh, Surgical Extraction, even though I doubt our opponent has brought that in. So I'll flash that back. And then Thought sees. Otherwise, the more mana efficient play would have been to play the one from hand. But our opponent could have answers for um, cards in Graveyard. Their hand's pretty good. Gurmag, Death Shadow, Explosives for the Lingering Souls, and Liliana, which is also quite effective against the Spirit Tokens, as well as being able to get back a creature. So I think it makes sense to take Liliana, even though they can't cast it at the moment, since I'm not going to overextend with my Spirits into the Explosives. And if I'm not overextending, then Liliana is at her best, since she can just take out the Spirits one by one. And of course, Liliana can also just get back one of the creatures if I discard those. So long term, I think the Planeswalker is the biggest issue. And then we just need to be careful not overextending into this explosives. And we've got one answer for the first creature they play, which is probably going to be the Gurmag Angler. Suppose I could have also fired off the second Field of Ruin to maybe mess with their mana a little bit. Although now with the second Blood Crypt, it doesn't really accomplish a whole lot. So there's Gurmag Angler. Opponent is down to 13. So gotta be mindful of maybe not uh, attacking their life total this turn if we don't want them playing Death Shadow. Another Liliana means I don't mind as much. So we'll Edict them. I guess I can also just make him discard the Death Shadow here. So I think I want to save Field of Ruin for the second blue source so they can't Snapcast or get back a blue card from the graveyard. Since getting rid of one Blood Crypt doesn't accomplish much. 
since I don't need uh, double red. So let's play Liliana. Plus to get rid of the Death Shadow. And then attack for two, leaving a second Lingering Souls in the graveyard to flash back once they deploy the explosives. Don't think I want to commit both into it. And now I've got a Liliana which can answer the next set of creatures they play. Cycle Street Wraith, opponent down to nine. There's a Death Shadow right away. That's fine, can minus Liliana two turns in a row. And a Sword of Light and Shadow is uh, pretty sweet too. So let's see here, do I want to equip forcing the explosives or do I just attack and then flash back if they pop the explosives? Don't have any creatures to return from the graveyard at the moment. Um, but if I don't flash back, then I guess I'll be unable to attack them next turn because I'm pretty sure they're going to pop the explosives if I equip here. So I guess I maybe should have attacked first to see if they were going to sack the explosives. But right, opponent's going to just scoop it up here since they're facing Liliana, which deals with the shadow and the next creature they have. Liliana of the Veil just excellent in the matchup. All right, sweet. So we managed to defeat Grixis Death Shadow in three pretty interesting games. On to the next one. All right, we're on the draw and our hand seems okay. We've got a bunch of discard. Not ideal having Batter Skull in our opening hand, but at five mana we can still cast it if we need to. Especially in game one where we don't know what we're up against. This card can be a better card to have in our opening hand than a bunch of spot removal, for example. Let's see what we're up against. Turn one, tapped Blood Crypt. So it could be maybe a Junt Midrange deck, who knows. Let's lead with Inquisition. And yep, Junt confirmed. Can't take the Blood Braid, but we can take Tarmogoy for Liliana. I think I'll go with the Tarmogoyf here since we don't have a great answer to it. And then next turn we could Scholar to get rid of Liliana. Thoughtseize can deal with the Bloodbraid, but if our opponent top decks an answer for the Scholar in the meantime we could be in trouble. So opponent runs out Verdant. Alright, got our own Liliana, so that's a nice answer for Tarmogoyf if it ever shows up again. Let's see if we can take that Liliana. Opponent has a hand of just a bunch of lands, Liliana and Bloodbraids, so I'll take the Liliana and kind of disrupt the opponent's curve here some more. They've got a Ghost Quarter, so they're probably pretty heavy on uh, Ren and Six if they're willing to play a Colorless Land in their Jun deck. So I expect four copies of Ren and Six to be in their deck, which is not good news since that card's very good against their deck, between their Confident and Lingering Souls. Opponent plays Blooming Marsh, so that's the card they drew for the turn. Alright, let's start by attacking for two. And I think I'm forced to Thought Seize the Bloodbraid instead of playing Liliana here. Since Bloodbraid would be pretty bad for us. And then just play Tap Godless Shrine, I think, since I'm not going to sacrifice a clearing anytime soon. Alright, Lightning Bolt takes care of our uh, Scholar, so they can play Liliana. And I guess we'll discard Collector Brutality here if they plus, but our opponent decides to just uh, keep Liliana at 3, which makes sense. Alright, I guess I'll play my own Liliana and plus, discarding Brutality, play Shambling Vent, and if our opponent pluses, then I could discard a Clearing, but then uh, I'll need to top deck a land before playing Batter Skull, but I think that's okay, since getting rid of the Peatland is actually pretty relevant, since that represents a random card. Whereas uh, Brutality is probably not going to be super relevant since the opponent's not playing Dark Confident themselves. Especially if they have four random sixes, which we suspect with the Ghost Quarter. And then Shambling Vent can help us maybe pressure Liliana as well. So our opponent's top decking, I guess they have a Ghost Quarter which can deal with the Shambling Vent. But then maybe they're unable to cast uh, Bloodbraid off the top. Alright, there's random six. So that can return the Peatland back to their hand as well. To draw more cards and plays well alongside Liliana. So I think I'm discarding the clearing since I'm hoping to be able to stick a Batter Skull. If I don't draw the land, then uh, keeping Batter Skull might have been worse since then I'm not going to be able to play anything and basically lose two cards from my hand. All right, I did find the planes, so I will just uh, play the Batter Skull here. It does die to Liliana, but I can still pick it back up at some point. So yeah, true grind fest, but uh, Ren and Six definitely a problem card for our deck. So let's see how we fare against it. 
They've got the whole engine here, Ghost Quarter as well, so they can start taking out our dual lands. Although we do have a fair number of basic lands, so it shouldn't be too bad. Although for now they're probably just going to draw cards with the Peatlands. The only thing going for us is that we have a Liliana at a bit more loyalty. Although Ren and Six can also deal damage to it if they feel threatened. Opponent up to three cards in hand. The card that's very good in the mirror on our side, of course, Stoneforge Mystic. Although it's not like the Jun deck is uh, short on answers. And I'm pretty sure that uh, the Jun decks nowadays will also start playing more copies of uh, Kologan's Command, which is also very good against all the artifacts. If I activate Shambling Vent, I'm sure we'll see a Ghost Quarter, but it's not like we have a much uh, better option here. If I return Batterskull, I want to do it end of turn, so they can make me discard to the Liliana or a Thoughtseize. If they have Spot Removal in hand, I guess that messes with our plan, because then we'll be unable to pay 3 mana to return Batterskull to our hand. But they're just going to Ghost Quarter, which at least gives us another land. And then I get to play the Marsh Flats plus Liliana. Put on this card's Black Leaf Cliffs. And I'll just pass the turn. I suppose I could Marsh Flats sacrifice on upkeep, since if I do it end of turn and they just drew into, let's say, Kologan's Command, that could be bad. Although I guess Kologan's Command can also make us a discard. So it would have to be like Assassin's Trophy, maybe. I guess it's still worth it. I guess against the Ghost Quarter, I might want to get the Godless Shrine instead of a basic land, although the damage could matter as well, but I think I still do, in case I start Ghost Quartering all my uh, non-basics. Raging Ravine, a nice creature land for the opponent, and Ren is gonna shoot down Liliana so we can't ultimate, which makes sense. End of turn, I'll return Batterskull to my hands. I can play the Inquisition before playing the Batterskull. And they have another Renin 6 and a Bloodbraid that they can play next turn. Although we can make him discard it right now, so that works out. Alright, so true grind here. Opponent can cash in their Liliana for the germ token. The Raging Ravine can pressure Liliana. Ren is gonna return the Peatlands to try and uh, maybe attack with the Ravine. Nope, just to draw cards. That probably implies they have another answer for Liliana here, otherwise we can now ultimate since they didn't ping Liliana with the Renan 6. And they can no longer animate the Raging Ravine. So maybe they have an Assassin's Trophy for the Liliana here. Or just a Burn Spell so we can't ultimate. Yeah, Lightning Bolt. Maybe two Lightning Bolts. Or Lightning Bolt plus a Scavenging Ooze. Fair enough. Inquisition, not what we need. What we want a top deck here, Lingering Souls would be great, Stoneforge Mystic would be decent, just any threat basically. Although uh, they're confident, not great in the face of Renan 6. So I think here I'm forced to uh, Edict. And then they can finish off Liliana with Renan 6. But I can return the Batter Skull to my hand end of turn. And then replay it and hopefully uh, it will stick. So Liliana down. And they found another Liliana. Gets rid of our Inquisition and also represents more answers for the Batter Skull here. So the game continues. Now would not be a great time to top deck something powerful since we're kind of committed to playing the Batter Skull. Path Exile kind of stranded in our hand, so lines up all for the opponent's Liliana if they decide to plus. All that are likely just minusing here. Well, these uh, top deck wars are pretty exciting. Anything can happen. Inquisition clears the path. And they can Edict with Liliana, draw more cards with Renan 6. So yeah, the two mana Planeswalker definitely being quite powerful in this spot. If we top deck Lingering Souls, we could both cast and flash it back. Which means we could uh, maybe pressure these Planeswalkers, especially with the Batter Skull in play. Instead, we drew Fatal Push, not what we want in this spot. So again, I'm just going to have to say go. Liliana shines in spots where the opponent is stranded with a bunch of spot removal in hand. Gets Ghost Quarter, get back Batter Skull. Sort of fire an Ice to draw. Well, that's a little awkward here since now one of them might get discarded to Liliana, but I guess if I play Batter Skull again, they're probably minusing. So I might be able to then play the sword next turn. 
opponent has a Ghost Corridor in hand that we know about. So they're likely just minusing Liliana. If they don't draw anything, activate Raging Ravine. Renan 6 also dangerously close to an ultimate. So that's why I like the one-off Celestial Purge in the sideboard, since it's uh, a nice answer to the two Planeswalkers, which is the permanent type that our deck might struggle with the most. After sideboard, our opponent also picks up Plague Engineer, most likely, unless they don't think we have Lingering Souls in the deck. So that's another problem card. And of course, if they have a bunch of Colagans commands, those will be very good against us as well. All right, opponent does decide to make us discard instead. So maybe they have another plan for this Batter Skull. If this is a draw step Colagans command, that would be painful. So maybe your opponent's just planning to chum block with the Raging Ravine. Could also be the case, but it's not like we can do much about it. Can I beat the Renan 6 Emblem or do I attack Liliana anyway? I mean, if they just cast like a single Lightning Bolt, it's not too bad. It's not like they have a bunch of lands in hand. So I think I still go after Liliana. And do we see a chum block with the Raging Ravine? Looks like it. Play Stoneforge, get our last sword. And I'll play it right away. And Light and Shadow can definitely get us back into the game here. Opponent sacks the Peatlands, replays one. Still don't see a Renan 6 emblem, just keeps plussing. Getting back those Peatlands. Liliana makes a sacrifice a creature, Stoneforge can go. Sword of Light and Shadow only triggers if I attack a player here, and I kind of need to attack the Planeswalkers. The only creatures that we can get back here, Scholar and Stoneforge, not too impressive when there's no artifacts left in our deck to search up. So I might as well equip, since I'm not doing anything else with my mana. And gain a bit more life. And I think I gotta attack Liliana here to get rid of the Edicts. Although it could easily have another Liliana in hand at this point. But I need to get some traction going. At least we're safe from a Fatal Push at this point. It's gonna be Bloodbraid, spin the wheel. What do we get? Another Renan 6, that's not too bad. So just a 3-2 haste. Can block our Batter Skull. If we had the other sword then we could attack past the 3-2 red and green creature. Opponent does decide to make an emblem here, so... Instant and Sorcery cards in Graveyards have Retrace. So they can start casting Lightning Bolts from the Graveyard. Which is pretty effective. Although they only have the one red mana, so no double lightning bolts quite yet. Alright, there's a Lingering Souls that I was talking about this entire time. Let's attack Red and Six. And Lingering Souls also gives us some flying creatures to put those swords onto. I think a flashback Lingering Souls could be bad against the Maelstrom Pulse, but that would be good against our equipment as well. This could be a call against command and our opponents deciding what to get back from the graveyard as we see command destroying Batter Skull and returning Bloodbraid. Could have kept up the mana to return Batter Skull, but then our opponent would have just cast it at some other time when we were tapped out. Still have our Sword of Light and Shadow, which can return Stoneforge or Scholar. Renan 6 returns a Lance, which of course also fuels the uh, emblem here, which is kind of the biggest issue at the moment. Opponent's never gonna run out of action, and casting a Colgan's command every turn is gonna get old pretty quickly. Liliana of the Veil to draw. I think I sent all the spirit tokens at uh, Renan 6 here. Since if they have a Fatal Push, they can cast two of them thanks to the Emblem, and then the Germ at our opponent, so we get the ability from the sword. But I don't think we're gonna survive the Emblem for a very long here. So I'll return Scholar. which sees a hand of Bloodbraid and four lands, and we'll play Liliana. And make him discard. Our opponent only having the one red source is definitely hurting them, since that limits how many spells they can cast from the graveyard. I think our opponent is still favored, but we've got a few turns where if we top deck well, we could add enough stuff to the board to make it difficult for the opponent. Scholar also being an artifact doesn't help us against uh, Colagan's Command. Colagan's Command deals with the Scholar and or Sword, leaving us with four Spirit Tokens with our opponent at 14. Another Stoneforge doesn't do a whole lot. 
So yeah, at this point, I'm not sure what our good top decks are. With the emblem, things are pretty rough. Yeah, I don't think we have a ton of good uh, top decks left other than more Lingering Souls. After sideboard, things should improve a little bit. Alter opponent also picks up more answers for the Lingering Souls tokens. And Lingering Souls used to be a very good card against Junt, but now with the addition of Renan 6 and Plague Engineer, it kind of shored up those weaknesses. And there's Maelstrom Pulse, the perfect answer to the Lingering Souls. I think I can scoop it up here. Alright, so what do we want against the Junt? So Dark Confident, good if our opponent doesn't have a Renan 6, very bad if they do have one. So overall, I'm lukewarm on the Dark Confident here. Typically in the mid-range mirrors you want to take out some number of discards since it often comes down to top decks as we saw in that game and top decking an Inquisition on turn 6 or 7 isn't ideal. That being said, it is one of our few ways of getting rid of a Renan 6 before it comes down, so we might still want to keep some answers. Um, Thoughtseize also gets rid of Bloodbraid Elf and our life total isn't under a huge amount of pressure, so I could see keeping two Thoughtseize, maybe one or two Inquisition and shaving a couple of them. Although we'll see how many cards we want to be bringing in here. Scholar also pretty vulnerable, opponent has plenty of answers for it. Brutality not at its best in this matchup I would say. Nile Spellbomb fine as it shrinks down Tarmogoyf, can mess with uh, Renan 6 a little bit. So I don't mind bringing it in. Celestial Purge, nice answer to the Planeswalkers. We can consider some number of Fulminator, although it's pretty weak against Renan 6 as well. Gideon definitely comes in as just a nice threat. And Kaya's Guile is probably okay too. Don't think I want Ashok, it can mess with their fetch lands, but overall it's pretty low impact. And I don't think I bring in Fulminators, so... I've got these four cards that I'm happy to bring in. And I think I'm just gonna shave one Brutality and two Dark Confidence. I think our best hope is just disrupting the opponent early, keep them off balance and then leverage an early Stoneforge Mystic, Dark Confident or Tide Hollow Scholar kind of disrupting their plan and maybe try and close out the game quickly with the Lingering Souls. I don't think we're favored if the game stalls out for very long, as we saw in that game. But yeah, we'll give this a shot. Also being able to answer Golgan's commands before they can destroy our equipment is pretty big. I still like some number of uh, discard spells. Would like to be on the play, sometimes in the mid-range mirrors it can also be fine to be on the draw, since uh, the amount of resources matters. This hand seems fine, multiple Lingering Souls could be good if they don't have Engineer or Maelstrom Pulse. So this hand, for example, could benefit from some discard to maybe clear the path for uh, the Lingering Souls or the Sword, in case of Colgan's command. Opponent does have a Thought Seize, takes a Sword, so probably implies they don't have a Colgan's command. Alright, Stoneforge was a great draw. Search up Batter Skull. Hope they don't have a clean answer here. So it's going to be a fatal push, so that's going to slow us down. No land, sadly, so we're just stuck saying go. And there's Plague Engineer, as we suspected. I think I'm going to path that over purging it, since purge is a cleaner answer for Planeswalkers, even though I don't love ramping the opponent. Inquisition to draw. Maybe take away a Planeswalker here. Their hand is Ooh, Stormagoyf, Liliana, Bloodbraid. Well, that's a lot of creatures. We only have one path as a nice answer for Tarmogoyf or Ooze. Ooze also pretty annoying against Lingering Souls, so I think I take the Ooze here. Since if we cast Lingering Souls and our opponent plays Ooze and activates it, that's pretty bad for us. Yeah, it's still going to be an uphill battle. On the bright side, our opponent could play Bloodbraid with no creature on our side in play, so if they cascade into removal spell, it's not going to be at its best. And the opponent does go for the Bloodbraid, so gotta hope they hit a Lightning Bolt, for example. Hits Inquisition instead, that's annoying. Can take the Celestial Purge or the Path, takes a Path. So yeah, stumbled on lands a little bit. Lingering Souls would have been effective after we dealt with the Plague Engineer but it might end up being too slow. Inquisition, I think we're still casting that, taking the Goyf. Now that we don't have a clean answer for it. Leaving them with Liliana of the Veil. Don't really mind if our opponent pluses Liliana, because then we can flash back Lingering Souls as well. I really just want to pick up a couple lands here. There's Lily. 
into Assassin's Trophy the Shambling Vent, that's fine. Actually gives me an untapped land, so I can purge the Liliana right away here. So I don't really mind. So I'll purge the Liliana. Discard the Lingering Souls. So at the very least we can flash it back. Alright, so we're behind, but it's not impossible to come back from here, since Lingering Souls is a very powerful tool in the matchup. And there's a land. I think to be mana efficient I'm casting the one from hand. It's worse if your opponent top decks like a Scavenging Ooze, because then they get to deal with both Lingering Souls in the graveyard. But if I top deck a Black Source and I can flash back both souls if I want to, which uh, seems appealing, also means if they top deck Inquisition they don't get any value. And I'm okay trading for the Blood Braid here. Put on Sags the Peatlands. The trade happens. Colagans Command would also be very bad for us here. Instead it's Liliana, but our opponent does not make us discard Batterskull. Urborg means we can flash back both Lingering Souls. And I think we do in the spots. Just gotta hope they don't have another Plague Engineer or Maelstrom Pulse. So our opponent clearly has a good card in hand, otherwise they would have plussed Liliana. So it could be another Blood Braid. There goes Batterskull, we've got one equipment left in the deck. And Anger of the Gods, well, not a card I necessarily expected, but pretty effective against uh, Spirit Tokens too. Alright, so we've got four lands in play, points empty-handed with a Liliana on four loyalty. So we're definitely behind, but not our Lingering Souls a good top deck. So if our opponent misses for a couple turns, we maybe get a sword going with the Stoneforge. We could be back in business. Tarmogoyf, though, a pretty good clock for the opponent. 5-6. Sacks Spirit Token. Inquisition, pretty poor top deck, so that's kind of what I meant with uh, not wanting too much discard in this type of matchup. And I'll go after Liliana. Probably just taking the damage from the Tarmogoyf, hoping to find an answer for the Goyf sooner or later. Got a bunch more Lilianas we can top deck as uh, good answers. Fatal pushes. And just a land for the opponent, Liliana pluses. Well, if we find an answer for Tarmogoyf, then we're not too far behind anymore. Swamp the draw. So do I leave a spirit back to chum Tarmogoyf? If I take another five, I guess even six if uh, Liliana ends up in the graveyard since there's no planeswalkers at the moment. Yeah, I don't think I can take that, otherwise I'm dead to a blood braid off the top. So I'm gonna have to leave one spirit back. And hope to top deck an answer next turn, hope the opponent misses. But yeah, you don't really want to be in a top deck war against Jund. So I don't think we're favored in the matchup. They have a few more tools with Ren and Six and Blood Braid to go over the top. We do maybe have a bit more game against a deck like Tron, since we have those main deck Field of Ruins, more disruption with a Scholar. And we might also be slightly better against the burn decks with the few life gain spells in the main deck. Which is also a matchup that uh, Junt nowadays isn't super favored against anymore. Although now maybe with uh, graveyard decks being a smaller part of the mana game, the Junt decks can afford to play more anti-burn cards on the sideboard. So maybe that matchup will be uh, a bit better than it used to be in the last couple months. Alright, send in the spirits. Did find an answer for the Tarmogoyf, so you know, still in the game. Life totals are pretty equal, and it's just that uh, the average top deck, I think, favors the Junt side. Alright, Podon just passes a turn. Is this a draw step Colagans, making us discard and returning Bloodbraid? Sure looks like it, and yep, there it is. Alright, well, at least we didn't draw anything relevant, but that Bloodbraid is going to be an issue. Now I could leave the two tokens back to try and block the Blood Braids, but I think the odds of our opponent finding some sort of removal spell for one of the tokens means that the double block isn't going to happen, so I'd rather just get in my two points of damage. Also, if I top deck my uh, last sword, I still want to have some creatures in play to equip. Same with Stoneforge Mystic. I guess my opponent might run out of time before they actually kill us, which would be an unfortunate uh, end of the game. Alright, there's Blood Braid, finds a Lightning Bolt. Well, it's gonna close out the game pretty quickly. And it did bolt the Spirit Token instead of our face. So we can double block the Blood Braid, another Lingering Souls of the top. Well, we're drawing pretty well. 
just gonna go face, make four more spirit tokens, and hope to uh, get there. I doubt we're sandbagging Maelstrom Pulse at this point. So hopefully we can dodge the second Plague Engineer or Maelstrom Pulse over the top. It's gonna be Ren and Six, still pretty effective here. Takes out the Spirits. Bloodbraid attacks, so now we gotta make a decision. Do we fall to three? Probably not, I think I just trade and then kill Ren. And be left with two Spirit Tokens. Looks like they have another Assassin's Trophy. Alright, so that kills our Spirit Token while letting the Bloodbraid survive. But maybe we get to take out Renan 6. Fatal push. Alright, so if they enable Revolt for us, I can take out Bloodbraid. So we're dead to another Bloodbraid or Lightning Bolts. And it's gonna be Maelstrom Pulse on the token. Well, it does enable Fatal Push. I could push my own token so I can save the other, but I would rather just kill the Bloodbraid here. So they probably should have attacked before Maelstrom Pulsing here, because now we get to kill the Bloodbraid. So we're back in the top deck war, but we've depleted most of our Lingering Souls. Play a Scholar. Opponent just has a Blackleaf Cliffs in hand. Saving it for an opposing Liliana of the Veil. I don't think this 2 mana 2-2 two, two is going to get there. Another Assassin's Trophy. Got one basic land left. Alright, so still top decking here. There's Liliana, they can discard their Blackleaf Cliffs. But now we've got an answer for a future creature, so... Yeah, opponent's got one minute left to close out this game. They might not get there in time. Picked up a land. Field of Ruin the draw, nice answer for... A potential creature land from the opponents which Liliana can't answer. So it's gonna come down to the wire here. Can our opponent win the game in time? They got 30 seconds. Another Field of Ruin. Could ultimate Liliana next turn, potentially. Lightning Bolt goes after Liliana. They could have gone face, but they decided to play defensively. 10 seconds on the clock. Oh no. Well, this is gonna be a first. A controversial win against Junt as our opponent times out, so it is a bit unfortunate that we don't get to see the natural conclusion of this game, and I think the Junt deck is probably favored in the matchup overall, they were ahead of game, and uh, with some better top decks near the end they definitely could have won it, but uh, yeah, I guess I'll take it, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the play, and well, as much as I like Stoneforge Mystic, I don't think I want to keep this necessarily, I guess we do have a silent clearing to cycle, so if our opponent doesn't have any disruption for the Stoneforge, this hand could be keepable if they go turn one discard or uh, some counterspell for the mystic then our hand doesn't do enough so i think we'll mulligan here with a london mulligan we should be able to be a bit more generous with our mulligans this hand's not amazing having two of our equipment and no stone forges but i think i'm still willing to keep and probably hang on to the sword over batter skull since it's a bit cheaper to combine with lingering souls and then we'll lead with Turn one Swamp, in case we need to Fatal Push. Let's see what we're up against. It's gonna be a Wooded Foothills. Picked up a Shambling Vent, which we can play here. Opponent fetches in their main phase for Stomping Ground into Eldrazi Temple and Mattery Shaper, so this is a red-green Eldrazi deck. Fair enough. Well, Mattery Shaper lines up pretty great against Liliana of the Veil, sadly. And sort of Light and Shadow, not too relevant. Picked up another Liliana. I guess I'll bite a bullet here and just... Fire one off, even though it doesn't feel great. Gotta get past the matter reshapers to get to the Thought Not Seers. The alternative play would have been Lingering Souls in the hopes of trading for the matter reshaper, so Liliana lines up well against uh, future Eldrazi, but they're not guaranteed to trade for the tokens, and then it's pretty awkward if they curve into more Eldrazi next turn. Although, of course, uh, Thought Not Seer can take away the second Liliana, but then we can protect the first one with the Lingering Souls while we get back up to two loyalty. Opponent hits an Arbor Elf, fair enough. Can't fail push that one quite yet. Red-Green Eldrazi, definitely a deck that uh, has kind of fallen off the map recently, but uh, cool to see it back. So the appeal of playing red is the Eldrazi Obligator, I think it's called, that can steal an opposing creature for a turn. And it's also just a 3-1 haste, so it can also pressure our Planeswalker, for example. This is a lot of mana, is this is a Reality Smasher. It is. 
So hopefully we can pick up a land so we can Fatal Push Plus. Play a second Liliana. This one does indeed kill our Planeswalker. And there's a land perfect. Now Marsh Flats plus Fatal Push can also answer a Thought Knot Seer, but in this case I think I just want to deal with the board. So let's push plus Liliana number two. Opponent still has five cards in hand. They got a nice two for one off the Mattery Shaper. So we're still behind, but not by too much. Plane should be fine. Lingering Souls can be good against Eldrazi. It's just not great against uh, Reality Smasher itself, as it can just trample over. Lightning Bolt takes care of Liliana. Field of Ruin also an answer for Shambling Vent. It's just going to be a Mind Stone for now into another Mattery Shaper, perhaps. Yep. Field of Ruin could take care of Eldrazi Temple. And then I can still cast Lingering Souls. Is that better than just casting and flashing back Lingering Souls? I don't mind dealing with the Temple here. Slows them down just enough. And I don't really mind if they keep their Field of Ruin for the Shambling Vent. Don't have any creature in the graveyard yet for the Sword of Light and Shadow, so hopefully we find some of those. And I think I take a hit for now, because if I trade then I can't connect with my sword, which seems better. Sanks the Mind Stone. And Arbor Elf, so no Thought Not Seers at least. And Field of Ruin on Shambling Vent. Got a couple basics left. And Sword of Fire, nice. Actually, quite a bit better than Sword of Light and Shadow here, so let's go for it. Can shoot down this Arbor Elf. I think that's better than going after the Matter Reshaper. Find Liliana. Alright, so we're kind of doing it here. Depends if our opponent has another heavy hitter in hand. Tireless Tracker, pretty nice. And they can get it out of range of the Sword of Fire Nice, but we can shoot down the Mattery Shaper, hoping they don't have another creature, and then Edict with Liliana. So that's kind of the hope. Reshaper puts us to 9. And another Lingering Soul, still have one in the graveyard we can flash back. I guess we'll start by attacking. I think I'm okay attacking with the 1-1. One, one. 2 to the Mattery Shaper. And what do they reveal? Snow-covered forest, that's acceptable. Although it does trigger the Tireless Tracker, so they get a bit more value on the way out. But let's uh, take care of it. Drew into a Path to Exile, so that's another answer for a big Eldrazi. Opponent sacks a clue, they've got three cards in hand. And we'll flashback Lingering Souls. All right, let's see if our spirits can get across the finish line. Opponent cycles Forgotten Cave. Cycles Tranquil Thicket, lots of lands here. And scoops it up, all right, sweet. So we got her thanks to our Sword of Fire Nice. How do we want to sideboard against a red-green Eldrazi? Don't exactly know their entire 75. I'm guessing Plague Engineer naming Eldrazi is okay. Do I want Kaya's Guile? It kind of has the same weaknesses as Liliana of the Veil. Vale. Don't think it adds much. Ashok, they don't play Expedition Map from the looks of it, so don't think it's necessary. Uh, Fulminator Mage is a consideration, although it's not as effective as against uh, regular Tron. Stoneforge Mystic, definitely very good in the matchup. They need a Lightning Bolt to deal with it right away, essentially. I like the Scholars, Brutality is pretty weak, so that can come out. Sword of Light and Shadow, also not exceptional in the matchup. So could see cutting that. Any other changes? Uh, Fatal Push. Good against their creatures if we can enable Revolt. Uh, good against Arbor Elf, I suppose. Otherwise, not amazing. So I could see shaving one or two copies there as well. And keep the Inquisitions as early disruption. So let's cut two Fatal Pushes. And then I think I just bring in two Fulminators instead of the full three. Since it's not amazing in the matchup, but just good enough to bring in. It is nice alongside Sword of uh, Light and Shadow if we can ever loop that but maybe that's a bit ambitious, and it's also pretty mana-intensive. So yeah, we'll give this a try. And Gideon was also a consideration, although it can get outsized by a Reality Smasher trampling over our tokens, so I don't want to rely on Planeswalkers too much. 
The sand is great. Got removal for a big Eldrassi. Turn to Stoneforge. So if they don't bolt it, we can maybe put a Batter Skull in play on turn 3. They're confident as another threat that they kind of have to deal with. Although they do have the turn 1 ramp spell in Utopia Sprawl. So yeah, Fulminator Mage lines up pretty well against the land enchantment here. I'm okay playing the Shambling Vents. No Eldrazi Temple at least. It's going to be Tireless Tracker. Alright, I think I let them keep the Tireless Tracker and just play my own Stoneforge here. Pretty close call. I think I'll go with the Batter Skull this time. I already have four lands, so I'm not too far away from just hardcasting it. And if I get Sword of Fire and Ice, maybe they don't feel the urge to kill the Stoneforge as much. It's going to be Eldrazi Temple, so we could see a Reality Smasher, which would be pretty bad for us. It looks like they have it. Alright. So now I have to decide what to do next. So I don't think I have time for this Field of Ruin play at the moment. Kind of need to deal with the board. So I can just put a 4-4 lifelinking Batter Skull in play to try and raise this Reality Smasher, which should work out pretty well and just path the Tireless Tracker so they don't get too much value. Also using Field of Ruin if I'm about to path them and give them an extra land. Doesn't make a ton of sense since we're not really denying them mana. And I'm just gonna end up fetching a Plains. I should have cast this Path Exile on their upkeep actually, so that the land comes into play tapped. Since it's not like they have an instant speed way of putting a land in play for the Tireless Tracker. And I guess I should fetch up a Plains right now since otherwise they could bolt my Stoneforge in response to me fetching and be unable to put the Batter Skull in play. Opponent could also have cards like a Braids as nice answers for the Batter Skull, so wouldn't be surprised to see that. Do they have another Reality Smasher? That would be unfortunate. Instead, another Tireless Tracker. Alright, Smasher attacks. We'll take it and we'll put a Batter Skull in play. And Ancient Grudge instead to deal with the Batter Skull. Yeah, that's pretty effective. So, it did get punished pretty badly for not uh, pathing in their upkeep since they ended up uh, spending all their mana. Otherwise, I would have gotten a hidden with the Batter Skull, which would have made a pretty huge difference. I'm pretty low on life, so I don't have time to really do much with these Dark Confidence. So I don't really have any great options. No cards that line up uh, particularly well against the Reality Smasher. And no answer for the Starless Tracker, which is going to get out of hand. Opponent's got a Lightning Bolt as their last card. And I guess I'll cast a Lingering Souls here. Lost out on 4 life essentially. Probably would have still been in trouble against this uh, Ancient Grudge and... Tracker plus Reality Smasher combo. Even if I Inquisitioned the Ancient Grudge, they could have flashed it back. So they've got two clues. This can become up to a 5-4. So even if we triple block, we can't trade for it. So I guess I'll just like chum block the Tireless Tracker with a Spirit Token. Take five. But it's not looking good here. Opponent had a pretty explosive start with the Temple and the Utopia Sprawl. And then, of course, the answer for the Batter Skull and Renan 6. There we see a good reason to play the Red Green Aldrazi deck and just burns us out here. Alright, so I did make a mistake. Don't think it ended up mattering or affecting the outcome of the game too much. So let's go to our sideboard again. Renan 6, definitely an obvious card for them to have. Did I forget to maybe sideboard in something for Renan 6 specifically? Celestial Perch can deal with it, but it's pretty narrow. It's kind of the only target for it, so I don't know if I want Celestial Purge for Renan 6. Um, sort of Fire and Ice should still be pretty good. We've got a bunch of discard for Ancient Grudge, but they can still flash it back as the issue. So hopefully they don't draw it. Um, yeah, I think I still like my setup. I think we resubmit and hope to draw into kind of the hand disruption part of our deck to start out, since that's the most effective against uh, some of their threats. And all right, we've got Inquisition to clear a path for Stoneforge into Fulminator to slow them down. So this is about as good as it gets. Hope they don't have an Ancient Grudge in hand. All right, their hand is Lightning Bolt, Double Matter Reshaper, Blood Braid. So let's just take the Lightning Bolts and then we get access to Stoneforge, hopefully Undisrupted, which can probably beat up on these Matter Reshapers. And then Fulminator can take care of the Eldrazi Temple, although they will get to play a turn 2 Matter Reshaper. Let's play Stoneforge. I 
think I'm still putting in Batter Skull before I cast a Fulminator Mage here. Just too important to get that out there. Sword of Fire and Ice also a pretty good uh, pickup if they don't find an Ancient Grudge anytime soon. So we'll just play a Shambling Vents and pass a turn. There's Field of Ruin. Did they pick up a Thought Seer? They did. Well, I think we're still putting in the Batter Skull. All right, we did it. Turn three, Batter Skull. Well, let's see what they take. Probably the sword. Takes a sword, so we don't have any equipment left in the deck. All right, so at this point, we're hoping to pick up some Lingering Souls, for example. I'm happy trading the Germ token for the Thought Knots here. And I think I just Fulminator Mage is their uh, temple here. Deny them the most mana. Could also go after the Stomping Ground, make it more difficult for them to cast a Blood Braid. But um, I think the temple is the biggest issue. Pass a turn. And then it's going to be at least one more turn before they can cast a Blood Braid in the first place. They picked up another Stomping Ground into Arbor Elf. Into a concession. All right, maybe a little bit premature here from our opponent. But I guess they didn't have a great answer for Batter Skull. And yeah, Batter Skull plus Stoneforge means an infinite supply of 4-4 uh, Vigilant Creatures, which lines up pretty well against everything but maybe Reality Smasher. So technically went undefeated, although we probably would have lost against the Jund deck if they didn't time out. So yeah, Stoneforge Mystic definitely is going to make a big impact on Modern, and this is just one of the many decks where you can play her, and I think uh, the deck overall performed pretty well. So that's going to do it for me today. want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.